Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Coin Collector. As August 14th, 1945 crept onto the pages of history, the White House announced that the shooting in World War II had come to an end. A victorious end that saw America and her allies triumph over tyranny. Once again, this nation had managed to protect its basic liberties. A wise prophet once said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. For liberty, Freedom and democracy are not prizes that are won by a people and put on a shelf. No people ever win permanent possession of these prizes. For liberty, freedom, and democracy are given only to those who first fight to win them and then keep fighting to protect them. Tonight's file opens in a photographic studio located in a shabby frame house in one of the poorer sections of a large Midwestern city. The proprietor of this establishment, one Arthur Belton, is just greeting a newly arrived customer. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, what can I do for you? You are the proprietor? Yes. Mr. Arthur Belton? That's right. Good. Are you uh, interested in some photographs? Uh, what uh, do you charge? For yourself? Yes. Four for ten dollars. A dozen for twenty-five. You have your choice. Mr. Belton, uh, I'm quite satisfied with your rates. I'd like to leave a deposit. Here. A deposit of a penny. I'm sorry, mister. What do you mean? I'm not taking those anymore. But I was told... You were told wrong. Arthur. Arthur. Uh, yes, Erna? I'm mailing out these copies of that wedding yesterday. Does each member of the family... 
Oh, excuse me. I, I didn't realize you were busy. Oh, that's all right, Erna. He's just leaving. You are sending me away? Yes. The verräterische Schweinze. Wait a minute. What is this, Arthur? Who is this man? Erna, keep out of this, please. He called you a treacherous swine. Let me have my penny. Just a minute. Let me see the coin. Did you bring this here? Yes. You presented it to my husband? To him, yes. Arthur, you were turning him away? Erna, I asked you to keep out of this. Oh, no. The war is over. That has nothing to do with our friendship for those who carry this coin. What is your name? Spangler. Karl Spangler. Are you in trouble? Yes. Come in the back and tell us your story. Erna! I bid you welcome, Mr. Spangler. Some ten days after the arrival of the mysterious visitor at the photographic shop, the whereabouts of this same man became a matter of great interest to Special Agent Jim Taylor at the local field office of the FBI. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Ross. Boss tells me I've been assigned to the case you're working on. Well, good. How far have you gotten with it? You're right in at the beginning. That's fine. In fact, here's Exhibit A right here. This blue denim shirt. Well... I'd say the first thing we should do is have it laundered, huh? I don't think all the laundering in the world would erase this P.W. on the back. Oh? Where'd the shirt come from? It was found in an empty freight car out in the yard. When? Just this morning. How about the owner? The car's been standing idle for ten days. It came in from the west. That gives him a pretty good start, huh? Yes, but we've got one break. I know who this P.W. is. Well, how'd you find out? This laundry mark here on the shirt. I checked it in our circulars on missing prisoners of war. Oh, I see. He's Lieutenant Carl Spangler, former member of the Africa Corps. Escaped from a California prison camp some 15 days ago. Here's the circular, eh? Thanks. It's a very complete description. Yeah, he shouldn't be hard to identify. If he's still here. Don't forget our lead is 10 days old. You mean he might have been just passing through? That's it, Ross. Oh, this is Exhibit B. That crumpled piece of paper? It was found in the pocket of the shirt. Any writing on it? Well, nothing visible. But look at these creases here. Mm -hmm. Appears to have been wrapped around a small coin of some sort. Can you see that? Yeah. I'm asking the laboratory to check with a parallel light beam for indented marks. To see if the coin left an impression on the paper? That's it. Then we start looking in a city of three million people for one man who has probably already left town. Good morning, Carl. Did you sleep well? Very well, thank you. Sit down. Your breakfast is all ready. <laughs> you are spoiling me, Anna. Here's your orange juice. Oh, fine. Uh, where's your dear husband up front in the studio? No, he went out. Poor Arthur. Why do you say that? Well, I would judge by his attitude these past ten days that he's not very happy about my being here. Does that bother you? Not in the least. My only concern is you. What do you mean? How you feel about me. Will you have your toast dry or buttered? <laughs> dry, please. Here you are. And your coffee. Thank you, my dear. Mmm. Excellent coffee. I'm glad. Arthur always says it's too strong. Uh, I have an idea that many things are too strong for Arthur. <laughs> How did you two ever get together? He was a friend of my father's. He came to meetings at our house before the war. Political meetings? Yes. Arthur was very active for our cause. Then why did he turn me away? My friend in the prison camp who gave me the penny and told me to present it here said he could be trusted. That was true. Why did he change? Because he wasn't being paid any longer. We lost the war. Remember? Remember? Uh, tell me, Anna. Yes? Why do you stay on with him? Oh, I don't know. Well, do you love him? No. Then why? Please, Anna, Carl. come here. No. I said come here. What is it? I think that there was a very good reason for you not leaving Arthur. <laughs> he did not know it, of course, but... 
You've been waiting for me. Carl. And now that I have... Oh, is that you, Arthur? Yes, sir, now. Good morning, Carl. Good morning. I've just been talking about you. With who? A mutual friend. Arthur, what is this? Now, don't be alarmed, my dear. I've been to visit Max Sebring. Oh? Who is he? A former member of our organization here. I told him you were staying with us. Why? He used to arrange shelter and transportation for people like you. Oh. He still does, Erna. He's going to take charge of Carl. What do you mean? I regret to say that he's leaving here. What? Max is transporting him to a farm some hundred miles upstate. Just a minute. I believe I have something to say about where I go. I'm afraid you haven't. Now, you understand an order, Carl. This is an order from Max. I thought you'd left the organization. I have. I only contacted Max as a favor to you. <laughs> How kind. So, Carl, you'll be at the corner of 12th and Main Street at 8.30 tonight. <laughs> Max will pick you up in his car. <laughs> Here's the latest flash on Exhibit B. Piece of paper? That's it. Was it loaded with invisible writing? No, not a trace of any. How about the coin angle? It was wrapped around one, all right. Foreign coin? No, an Indian head penny. What? Why would anyone want to keep a penny wrapped up? So he wouldn't spend it. Oh, no, wait a no, minute. Oh, no, I mean it, Ross. I think that Indian head was of great value to him. As a rare coin? No, as an open sesame. I don't get it. Well, I may be way off base on this one, but do you remember back before the war when we had our hands full of the boys from the Bund? Yeah. Well, the key men in that setup had various means of identifying themselves. Sometimes they used an old coin. Remember now? Yeah, of course. Well, our escape PW could be using that same system. And is being sheltered by one of the old Bundes? Could be, yes. Oh, excuse me. Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, the girl at your switchboard told me I should talk to you. Well, who is this, please? That doesn't matter. I understand you're the FBI man who is looking for an escaped German prisoner of war. Yes, that's right. If you wish to pick him up, he'll be at the corner of 12th and Main Street at 8.30 tonight. Goodbye. Oh, wait a minute. Hello? Hello? He hung up. Well, what was that all about? An anonymous tip on where we could pick up our PW. Really? Mm-hmm. The informer said that he'd be at the corner of 12th and Main Street at 8.30 tonight. Think it's a good tip? I don't know. We'll follow up on it anyway. Meantime, let's dig through the files and get a list of the ex-leaders of the Bund. You all dressed? Yeah, it's on you. It's too tall. Yeah, it looks fine. Has there not come back yet? No. I wanted to say goodbye to her. Well, she'll be here before you go. And we still have almost an hour. This place I'm being sent to, uh, what's it like? It's a beautiful farm. You'll enjoy it very much. Who lives there? An old couple. I know them. Charming people. I'd rather be here. Now, you're a soldier, Carl. As I said before, you must obey orders. I know. Who's that? Me, Erna. Now, we're in here, dear. Carl was afraid you wouldn't return in time. What delayed you? I went calling. Really? On whom? Max Sebring. Erna. I spoke to his wife. She told me that Max has been out of town for two weeks. Why, why, that can't be. I just saw him this morning. He's in California. His wife spoke to him on the phone out there an hour ago. Well, that's impossible. This is the man who was supposed to have ordered me away? Yes, Carl. Well, I don't understand. I do. You're being thrown to the wolves. Now, see Arthur, here. Father, you didn't speak to Max or anyone else. You just wanted Carl out of here. That's a lie. Then suppose you give us the truth. I have. He probably has the FBI or the police on that corner right now waiting to pick you up. I tell you, Max is in town. Then call him on the phone. Go ahead, call him. I... No. Then this was a trick? Yes. I knew it. Oh, look, Erna, I had to do it. I didn't want any part of him in the first place. I was through with everything he stood for. And then to have to watch you day after day, waiting on him, catering to him, fawning over him, knowing you were falling in love with him right under my nose, I... I had to do it. But you didn't get away with it. He's still getting out of here. I'm calling the FBI. Oh, no, you're not. (coughs) 
Well, darling, I guess I'll stay. We will return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, three questions and answers on the value of education. First question. How much better chance is a college-trained man or woman to become a leader in business, the professions, or the arts than the individual who doesn't go to college? Are the odds two to one, five to one, ten to one? Taking who's who in America as a measure of leadership, the odds in favor of the college-trained man or woman are 87 to one. Right now, I know that thousands of listeners to this program are saying to themselves, my children are going to have those 87 to 1 odds in their favor. Well, if that's the way you feel, then you'll certainly be interested in an equitable educational fund. Second question, what is an equitable educational fund? It is a life insurance plan that includes these important features. The equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. It summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative will be glad to show his copy to any sincerely interested parent. Get in touch with him tomorrow or call the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Curious Coin Collector. The late Adolf Hitler once boasted that Americans were a soft, decadent people, wholly unlike the Aryan Superman. Well, there is a difference between an American and a Nazi, because only a stubborn, one-track mind would refuse to admit that the Third Reich had gone down to defeat, would prefer to sit and wait for a new Hitler, a new call to arms a new chance to aid the fatherland. There are still such Nazis all over the world, and some of them, as proven by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, are right here, right here in the United States. Tonight's file continues. FBI Special Agents Taylor and Dixon acting on the anonymous phone tip that the escaped prisoner of war they were seeking would turn up at the corner of 12th and Main Street at 8.30 that night, arrived at this destination and patiently waited. They watched the hands of a corner clock slide past 8.30, past 9, past 9.30, and creep slowly up to 10 o'clock. Well, Ross, it looks like we've been handed one. Yeah. Think we should wait any longer? No, let's get back to the car. Okay. This was somebody's idea of a joke, I suppose. I don't think so. Why not? Well, this case hasn't been publicized. Very few people know that we're looking for Carl Spangler. Then how do you figure the call? Someone might just have been trying to turn him in, and it didn't work out. Oh, Ross, will you drive? Yeah, sure thing. Swell. Uh, back to the office? Yes, please. <laughs> Ross, where's that list of ex-bun members? Yeah, right, right here in my pocket. There you are. Thanks. Those two names at the bottom are the only ones who still live here in town. Sebring and Belton? That's right. I don't remember either one of them. Well, I remember Belton, all right. 
And what's the story on him? Native-born American, mm. Nazi sympathizer, very active with the Bund before the war. How about during the war? He was under surveillance. We didn't get anything on him, though. I see. These are the correct addresses on both of them? I believe so, Jim. Well, it's too late to contact them tonight. We'll get on this first thing in the morning. How is he, Carl? He has regained consciousness. That's good. For a while, I was frightened. About what? Well, that you might have killed him. (laughs) I'm sure he'd appreciate your concern. My only concern was the police. Oh. Is it safe to leave him alone in there? I have him bound and gagged. Oh, fine. What do we do now? I don't know. Obviously, we can't stay here. Then where do we go? Do you want to leave the country? Go home to Germany? Yes. Should say not. Much prefer to remain here. You mean you've learned to like America? <laughs> Not at all. (laughs) But if I were to settle down here, who knows? Someday I might be very useful to the fatherland. We both could be useful. And I repeat, where do we go? What did you do before you went into the army? I was, I guess you'd call it a commercial artist. Well, then we should go to a large city, preferably in the east. Darling, what would we use for money? I don't know. How much has your husband got? Four or five thousand, but it's all in the bank in his name. Checking account? Yes, but we can't touch it, Carl. He signs the checks. I think we might persuade him to sign one for us. How? Come, let's go see him. Carl, he'll never consent to it. Perhaps he'll have to. Go ahead, Ernest. Thank you. Good evening, Arthur. Anna and I wish to talk to you about something rather important. Shall I remove the gag? No, 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 he can hear. Arthur, we wish to go away. We need money. I understand you have several thousand in the bank. We'd like you to write us a check for the full amount. Carl, I tell you, he'll never do it. Go and get his checkbook, Anna. I think by the time you return, he'll be ready to sign. <laughs> Taylor speaking. Morning, Jim. This is Ross. Oh, good morning, Ross. I was waiting for your call. Are you ready to go calling on Belton and Sebring? No, the boss has put me on another detail. I'll be tied up on it for another couple of hours. I see. Uh, Ross, why don't you go ahead and interview them? See what you can pick up, huh? Okay. Who are you calling on first? Well, Sebring is the handiest. Belton is way up on North Main Street. Well, if I finish here in time, I'll try to meet you out there. Yes, Carl. What time does the bank open? Nine o'clock. Now, don't you think you should be getting over there? It's almost that now. I know, Carl, but I'd rather wait a while. Why? I don't want to be the first customer. They might get suspicious. Well, you said they know you there. Yes, but this is a very large check. What are you looking for? The keys to the car. Well, you'll check the gas and oil when you go to the bank, huh? Y- yes, I told you I would. Oh, here they are. Now, tell me, Anna, does uh, Arthur have a gun? Yes. Where is it? In the dresser next to the bed. Why? I think we should bring it along with us, uh, just in case. What's that? Oh, someone's come into the studio. What do we do? Go and get rid of them. But we, we don't... Do as I say. Yes? Good morning. Is Mr. Arthur Belton here? No, he isn't. Well, when will he be back? Well, I, uh, I don't know. Do you work here? I'm his wife. Oh, I see. My name is Dixon. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Well? I'm looking for information. Perhaps you can help me. What sort of information? About a man named Spangler, an escaped prisoner of war. Yes? We have reason to believe he's here in the city. I wonder if he tried to contact your husband. I wouldn't know. You say you have no idea when he'll return? No. Very well, then I guess I'll just have to wait. Put up your hands, <gasps> Mr. FBI. Well, 
Looks like we've finally caught up with you, Spangler. Yes. But it won't do you any good. Go to the bank, Anna. I'll take this gentleman back inside and introduce him to Arthur. Hello there. Oh. What do you want? Well, I've been ringing the doorbell here for the past five minutes. I wanted to get into the studio. We're closed for the day. You work here, do you? Yes. We're closed, I tell you. I wanted to see Mr. Belton. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh? Well, there's already been one agent here to see him. Oh? I'm Mrs. Belton. My husband left here with the other agent. I see. How long ago was this? Oh, at least a half hour. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm. Oh, yeah, Me. Close the door quickly. What's wrong? We've got to get out of here at once. Did you get the money? Yes, but there was another FBI man waiting outside of the door when I came in. Where is he now? I got rid of him. How? I told him that the other agent had already been here and had taken my husband away. I see. What did you do with the other one? He's in the bedroom with Arthur. Well, then let's get out of here. We'll use the back way. Come on. Very well. Stand where you are, both of oh. Who is this? The FBI. I had an idea you'd be here, Spangler. Really? Yes. Mrs. Belton told me my partner had left with her husband a half hour ago. That didn't add up because his car is still parked two doors from this house. Now, where is my partner? In the bedroom. Is he all right? Yes. He'd better be. Go on, Superman. Lead me to him. Erna Belton was tried and convicted of harboring an escaped prisoner and sentenced to a term in the federal penitentiary. Carl Spangler was returned to the custody of the United States Army. Yes, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And eternal vigilance might also be the motto of your FBI. For well, the men who comprise the Federal Bureau of Investigation are forever at work protecting your security. The wartime record of your FBI approached perfection. For despite the constant work of enemy agents, not one single piece of sabotage was ever committed within the confines of the United States. That kind of vigilance is the type that was rewarded in tonight's case. And that kind of alert watchfulness will continue to protect you, the American people, so long as there is an FBI. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children, an Equitable Educational Fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or call the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sugar Swindler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious 
and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sugar Swindler on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. <laughs> Fathers and mothers of America, upon the training you give your children depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, The Night of Terror. This is 1946, the second year of the Atomic Age. And in almost every field of endeavor, man is breaking through new frontiers. But there is one field in which man has not changed his ways. The field of crime. Since the incident of the apple, there have been certain men who could not resist temptation. The temptation to advance themselves at the direct expense of the rest of society. Those men we call criminals. And those men down through the ages have committed the same crime. Crimes ranging from robbery to murder. Tonight's file opens at a summer resort located on the shore of a lake near a large eastern city. In one of the cottages overlooking this lake, Two girls who work in the city are spending a hard-earned vacation. It is evening. One of the girls, Ann Madison, is dressing to go out. She calls to her friend. Ruthie. Yeah, honey? Do you mind if I wear your gold earrings? No, go ahead. Oh, thanks. What time is it? Uh, just 8.30. Oh, good. Hey, come on in here. Let's see how you look. Okay. Well? Well, you look lovely. <laughs> oh, thanks. <sighs> In fact, you look so lovely, I hate to see it wasted. Uh, what do you mean? You know what I mean, Anne. That guy you're going out with. Oh, now, don't start that again, Ruthie. You don't even know Al. Hmm. I know his reputation. Oh, Ruth. Look, I got the whole story on him the other night. I know, I know. He's a racketeer. He's no good. You told me all that. Well, doesn't that matter? Look, Ruth. I spend 50 weeks a year slaving in an office. My dates are usually a friend of my brother's or the boy next door. So? So this is a vacation. 
two short weeks away from that endless, dull routine. I'm going to make the most of it. Hmm. With Al. Yes, with Al. It's fun to be with him, exciting. Oh, sure, sure. We go to the best places, everybody knows him, we get the best table. And listen to me a minute, will you? Well, <sighs> I know how you feel. Believe me, I do. But just let me say something. Go ahead. When I was your age, a date with a guy like Al would have been exciting to me, too. But as you grow up, you learn things. Uh-huh. You learn that fellows you pick up at a dance, at a summer resort, who act like big shots like Al, don't run one, two, six with that friend of your brother's or the boy next door. End of sermon. Oh, Ruthie, you're awfully sweet. But don't worry about me, will you? <laughs> oh, that must be Al now. Oh. Is Al Benton here? Uh, no. You expect him, don't you? Oh, yes. And I'll come in and wait. Well, I... Ann, who's that? I don't know. What? Just the two of you here. What do you want? Al Benton. I told you he isn't here. I'll wait. Now, just a minute. Oh, hey, oh. you... I said I'll wait. In an FBI field office some ten miles from the lake resort, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. He is waiting, too. Waiting for a call from headquarters in Washington. Jim? Yes, Bob? What do you say about some dinner? No, you go ahead. I'm going to stick around here. Oh, something special? Yes, I'm waiting for a report from Washington. What about? Some fingerprints that I sent down there this morning. Oh. It's on that central bank holder. What's the story? Two men held up the cashier of the bank, took over $8,000. I see. The car they used was found about four hours later across the state line. Uh-huh. What about the two men? One of them is still on the car. Good. Not so good. He was dead, shot through the heart. Yeah. Well, what about the money? No sign of it. Uh-huh. Had there been any gunplay in the holdup? No. I believe he was killed by his partner. That's the usual loyalty of one thief to another. Yeah. Any identification? A dead man was named Johnson. At least that was one of his many aliases. Habitual criminal, long record. How about the one that got away? I've got a fair description on him, but I'm hoping for more than that. What do you mean? I picked up some prints in a car in the back of the rearview mirror. They weren't Johnson's. I checked on that. Those are ones you sent to Washington? Yeah, that's right. Well, Jimmy boy, I wish you luck. Uh, can I bring you back a sandwich? Oh, yes, will you? Ham and cheese on ride. Tastes fine. Okay. Coffee? Right. Anything else? Yes. Identification of those fingerprints. Mister. Yeah? Can I go in the kitchen? What for? I want to make some coffee. Stay where you are. Oh. Look, will you do us one favor? Will you put that gun away? Not till after I use it. Please, what is this all about? I told you I'm waiting for Al. Why? You'll see. You're going to shoot him, aren't you? That's right. Oh, no. C- couldn't you pick someplace else? No. Why not? Because I know he's coming here. What time is it? <sighs> Almost 9.15. He was due at 9? Yes. Well, remember what I told you. When he knocks, you answer the door. Ask him right in and don't rumble. Oh, no. I, I can't do it. You'd better, sweetheart, or all of you get it. Would you mind telling us why you want to kill him? No. Well? My brother and Al were partners. They pulled a stick up yesterday. Oh, after they'd done the job, Al knocked my brother off and beat it with the dough. How do you know all this? Grapevine. I even know he's planning a lamb out of town tonight and take this dame here with him. Anne, is that true? Yes. Oh. oh, but I didn't know anything about this other stuff. Honest, Ruth. Oh, baby, baby. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't answer that till I tell you what to do. Oh, but I... 
If that's Sal, tell him to come right over here. And don't give him no office that anything's wrong, understand? Yes. Okay, answer it. Hello? Is that you, Ann? Yes, Al. Look, baby, I got tied up here down at the inn. Let me send a cab up for you, huh? Well, We I... can leave from here. Uh, I'd rather not, Al. Huh? I, I'd rather you call for me. Well, it'll be another hour. Well, that's all right. Okay, see you later, honey. Bye. Bye. Is he coming? Yes. That's swell. One combination on rye coming up. Oh, thanks, Bill. And here's your coffee. Good. Oh, did anything break? Yes, plenty. A report on those fingerprints came in right after you left. Swell. Were they identified? Yeah. Belonged to a small-time racketeer named Al Benton. Al Benton? Mm-hmm. Hey, that name is familiar. Well, we picked him up for questioning on that liquor hijacking case last year. You remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I dug his picture out, and Williams took it over to the central bank. He just called back. Clerks identified Benton as one of the two bandits. Oh, you have been moving. Well, that isn't all. There's more? Yes, I started the quick check on Benton. Found he'd been living in a hotel over on 12th Street. But he'd moved? Yes, over a month ago. They know where he's gone? Well, he didn't leave a forwarding address, but the hotel porter remembered shipping his trunk to an inn out at Lakeside. Hey, that's the summer resort, isn't that's it? That's right. There are only two inns out there, and the first one I called told me that Mr. Al Benton was one of their guests. And all this happened while I was out to dinner? Well, that's the way it goes. You spend endless hours waiting and waiting, and then everything breaks at once. I suppose now you're heading for Lakeside. We're heading for Lakeside. What? You were so interested in the case, Bob, I had you assigned to it. Let's go. Hey, you. Huh? What is it? Sit down. Uh, Relax. Are you kidding? Sit down, I said. Okay. Look. Look, I can't stand this much longer than this way. Now don't you start again. Well, I can't help it. I, I can't... don't want no tears going when he shows you. Leave her alone, please. What time is it now? Ten fifteen. You should be here. Mister. Yeah? I believe that what you told us about Al killing your brother is true. Uh-huh. Why do you try to settle the score? Turn him over to the police. Let the law settle it for you. I do this my way. Yeah, but... I don't want to hear no more about it. Wait. What's the matter? There's... There's the headlights of a car coming up the hill. That's your private road, ain't it? No other houses on it? No. Okay, this is it. Oh, no. Shut up. Now, listen to me, both of you. When he knocks, Anne here answers the door. He's almost here. Listen, will you? Invite the guy to come right in. I'll take care of the rest. The car's out front. It stopped. Did you hear what I told you? Did you? Yes, yes. I'll have your girlfriend here with me. If you make the wrong move, it'll be just too bad for her. Uh, I'll, I'll do what you say. Quiet. Just a minute. There's no one here. Oh. There's no one out there. What is this? I tell you, nobody's You're there. You're lying. Who's the eight, huh? <laughs> Lucky I saw him through the window. That's why I come in from the back. We will 
return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, our weekly series of questions and answers on education. First question. Do you have to be a college man or woman to be elected to Congress? No, of course not. Yet in both the Senate and the House of Representatives, four out of every five members have attended college. Four out of five, 80 percent. Think that over, father and mother, and then say to yourself, my children are not going to be denied the advantage of a college education. If you're really sincere in that resolution, only a small sum each week invested in an equitable educational fund will do it. Second question, what is an equitable educational fund? It is a life insurance plan that includes these important features. The equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much would it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. It summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative will be glad to show his copy to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Night of Terror. There is little loss to the community when, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI... One hardened criminal does away with another. It is a case of one who lives by the sword, dying by the sword. But it is the business of law enforcement agencies to apprehend the murderer and bring him to the bar of justice. For here in the United States, it is the privilege of no one man to take the life of another. This is not a government of a person by a person and for a person, but of the people, by the people, and for the people. Tonight's file continues back at the lakeside cabin. The gangster who had waited for his intended victim is stretched out on the floor with a bullet through his head. The two terrified girls stand staring at the body. He, he's dead. That's right, baby. Al, you killed him. What else could I do? He was out to get me. Well, I'm calling the police. Now, wait a minute. We've been through enough tonight. Get away from that phone. No, no. Operator, operator. Get away, I said. Oh, Al. This ain't no time to be calling cops. Let's hang up this phone and forget about it. You cheap hoodlum. And make your girlfriend behave, will you? Get out of here, Al. Huh? I said get out. Hey, what is this? We got a date, remember? I found out all about you tonight. What you really are. I don't want any part of it. Well, now, wait, baby. You keep away from me. Okay. Now will you go? Uh-uh. No dice, Al. You're coming with me anyway. Oh, no. Look, baby, you know too many things about me now. You're coming with me, your girlfriend, too. I'll make up my mind what to do with you along the way. Hello, 
That looks like the door to the lobby down there at the end of the porch. Right. I think Lakeside Inn has seen better days. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. Go ahead, Bob. Thanks. Well, this is certainly a busy place. Yes, if you like canaries. Do you suppose they could tell us where the proprietor is? Oh, there's a bell over there on the desk. That might be a help. Come on. Okay. All I did is stop the concert. Well, I'll try again. Coming. Coming. Well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Are you in charge here? I'm the proprietor, yes. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Here are our credentials. Well, why are you here? We'd like to talk to one of your guests. A man named Al Benton. Oh, you're too late. What do you mean? He checked out of here just ten minutes ago. Where'd he go? I don't know, and to be frank with you, I don't care. I was very happy to see him leave. Why? He was a most unsavory person. I fell Did all he have along. a car, he... sir? Yes. Would anyone around here know where he was going? No. I... Oh, wait, wait a minute. Yes? I recall something about a girl he was going to meet. What? She lives in one of the cabins on the lake. Do you know her name? No, sir. Do you know which cabin? No, I don't. And where did you get this information? He ordered a taxi to be sent up for her. And then he changed his mind and went himself. Well, if he ordered the cab, he must have told the driver which cabin to go to. Hey, that's right. I'll check with my phone operator. She put in the call. I excuse me, please. Sure. Now, Jim, if he left ten minutes ago, that's not too much of a start. No. We could still nail him at the girl's cabin. That is, if we could find out which cabin it is. That's right. Well, gentlemen, I believe I have the information you've been seeking. Good. The girl's name is Anne Madison. The cabin is less than a mile from here. Can you tell us how to get there? Yes. Follow the road out front as far as you can go. Well, in which direction? Oh, to the left. Thank you. The cabin is on the hill. There's a driveway leading up there. Thank you, sir. Come on, Bob. All right. Stay right here by the car, both of you. I'm dumping this body back here in the bushes. should try to run away. Uh, uh, not now. Not here. He's too quick with that gun. Oh, we'll never get away from him. Yes, we will. I hope you're right. Oh, Ruthie. Forgive me, please. Oh, for what? This terrible mess. It's all my fault. Look, will you get out of it some way? I know, but... Shh, shh, shh. I want oh. you both to sit in front with me. Okay. And look... Let's get a few things straight before we take off. We'll be passing other cars, other people, maybe cops. Don't try to tip them off about our little party. Or you'll both be sorry. Okay, get in. Go ahead, Ann. All right. Wait a minute. Uh -huh. That car down there at the foot of the hill just turned in your driveway. A car coming up here? Yeah. Oh, thank heaven. Now listen, both of you. Wherever it is, I want you to get rid of them fast. I'll hide here in my car. If either one of you blow a whistle, this gun goes off... Hello. Hello. I'm looking for Miss Ann Madison. I'm Ann Madison. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh? We were informed that a Mr. Al Benton was on his way up here to see you. Al Benton? That's right. You know him? Well, i uh, sure she knows him, and he's here. Ruth! What? Look, we've been kicked around enough. If you want Al Benton, he's oh, right... Look out! Look out, you! Anybody hurt? No. Is Benton in that car? Yes. Come on, Pop. We don't seem to be gaining on him. I know. This road would only straighten out. I'd get a shot at one of his tires. I think it does after this bend. I'll try it now. Too high. He's turning left out to the peninsula. Stay with him. Can't even see him now. Wait until we get up over this hill. 
You know, Jim, if I remember right, there's a fork in the road up ahead. Yes, there it is. And no bend. No. Which turn should we take? Quick, Jim. Uh, turn right. I still don't see him. Keep going. I have a pretty good hunch this is the road he would take. Is that the municipal airport up ahead? That's it. Hey, look, there's his car now. Turn him to the airport gate. My hunch was right. I figured he'd head for here and try to get a plane out. Uh-huh. Give it everything you've got, Bob. We've got to stop him before he does board a plane. Be careful on this one. Oh, the guns, you mean? That's right. There's too many people here. Well, look. We... Wait. What? Do you see him? Yes. There he is up there by gate four. Come on. No, oh, Bobby's seen us. Yep. He's running through the gate. Let's step on it. Don't you think we should alert the field? We haven't got time. I don't see him. No. Maybe headed for those hangars over there. We couldn't get to them that fast. What do we do, Jim? We can't lose him now. I know, I know. Wait a minute. What? Look out there. There he is, running across the field. Oh, yeah. Look at that fool. There's a plane taking off. Oh, he doesn't man. see it. He's running right across its path. What? Bert, look out! Oh, right into the propeller. Pretty awful. Yes. Well, I'd say the file on Al Benton is closed. panic flight of Al Benton, which resulted in his violent death, saved the state the trouble of prosecuting him for first-degree murder. Your FBI is a business organization, and its business is the apprehension of criminals. The fact that there are 130,000 major crimes committed every month in this country does not indicate any laxity on the part of your FBI. It merely indicates that the same passions that have governed the lives of men down through the years are still vibrant. The same greed, the same lust for power, the same love of ill-gotten gain. When man loses those characteristics, crime will disappear from the earth. But until that time, your FBI will continue to operate as it has been operating, as a faithful servant, protector of the American people. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children, an equitable educational fund. Without obligation, he will show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. You'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Curious Coin Collector. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
the curious coin collector on This Is Your FBI. This Sunday marks the end of daylight saving time for those communities that have been observing it. If your community returns to standard time, This Is Your FBI will be brought to you next week at exactly the same time you heard it tonight. If your community is now on standard time, tune in one hour later next week. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, attention please. Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, the diamond-studded double cross. It is a grave indictment indeed that the silent accessory to practically every crime is the criminal's own mother, father, or guardian. The parent who was always too busy to watch how his or her son or daughter grew up, or who just didn't care what kind of companions they kept, where they went, and what they did when they got there. Or the parent who was too indulgent, who always gave in, who let the boy or girl have their own way so freely that soon, for them, the wrong way became the right way, the only way. Joe Bristol's mother had been that kind when he was growing up down along New York's waterfront, and she still was. That's why tonight's case is in the files of your FBI. The hot, humid air hung like smoke over the East River wrapping a damp shroud about the old barge tied up to the sagging dock. A lantern burned in the galley, but the woman was sitting outside on the deck. She was alone. In front of her, through the haze, swarms of lights burned in the forest of tall buildings. Behind her, an occasional tug or freighter groaned in passing. But she paid no attention to either. She just sat. Presently, she heard footsteps, familiar footsteps. Hiya, Mom. Quiet, son. What's the matter? You know how Mr. Braddock feels about you coming here. Oh. Where is he? He's in the cabin taking a nap. It's liable to hear him. Look, any time you got enough of him, sweetheart, just holler. Now, don't you talk that way, Joey. He's very good to me, except about you. He's just jealous because he ain't my old man. It's not that at all. What else does he want? As soon as Pop died, he got you and the barge, too. Joey, Mr. Braddock is a good man. Now, please run along. Maybe maybe I can meet you somewhere tomorrow. Uh, huh? But, Mom, uh, I got to see you tonight. Oh, heavens, you're not in trouble again. <laughs> no, not the kind you're thinking, sweetheart. I just want a little dough for a couple of days. Oh, I, I, I got a deal cooking, but uh, till it comes off, I need 20. Well, 
What kind of deal, Joey? Nothing for you to worry about, Mom, honestly. Look, I never know what you're doing anymore. I don't even know where you're living or how you... Oh, listen, he woke up. You gotta go, Joey. What about the dough, Mom? I gotta have it. Well, um, come back in the morning. He'll go to the barge office about eight. Okay. See you in the morning, sweetheart. Have a good nap, John. That was your son just here, wasn't it? Yeah. Want money, too, I suppose? I didn't give him any. Mary, I told you he had to stay away from here. Now, I got a right to see my own boy, John. I'm sorry, Mary. I, I just wish he was different. It, it's the only thing that ever makes trouble between you oh, and wait. me. Huh? John. What? Look. That man down on the dock. He's coming aboard. Yeah. Can I help you, mister? What? I said, can I help you? I... I don't know. What's the matter, mister? Is something wrong with you? I don't know. I feel so... John, he, he's fainted. Yeah, open the door, Mary. I'll lift him in on the bunk. Yeah. Now. Maybe you better get the police. No, no, no. He, he don't need the police now. He needs tending to. Just open the door. A little earlier that evening, Special Agent Allen of the New York office of the FBI returned from a trip down to police headquarters and entered the office of assistant to the agent in charge, Rutland, to report. Is it a case for us, Allen? Looks as though it might be. What's the story? J.B. Medford, representative of a large Chicago wholesale jewelry house, mm -hmm. left Chicago by train yesterday with sample case of jewelry, mm -hmm. due New York this morning. He hasn't turned up. Hasn't turned up where? He was to check in at the company's New York branch office at 10 a.m., but he didn't. What do they think? Well, they don't suspect Medford. He's been with the firm 20 years. Mm. And I take it they suspect foul play. Yeah, the jewelry he carried was worth about $20,000. Hmm. Now, here's a complete list and description of it. Looks like a case of robbery. What train was he booked on out of Chicago? The Manhattan, and they know he boarded it. The Chicago office confirmed that. But they don't know whether he arrived in New York on it. No, they haven't determined that yet. Then that's the first thing for us to find out. Oh, I have the number of the car and the space he occupied out of Chicago. Then you'd better start checking on it right away. Call me as soon as you get anything. Mom? Oh, Mom. I'm in here, Joey. Oh, okay. He's gone, huh? Uh-huh. I timed it okay. Just give me the dough, Mom, and I'll take... Hey, what's this? Who's the guy sleeping on the bunk? Huh? Oh, him. He's sick. Yeah? Yeah. He wandered onto the barge last night, right after you left, and then fainted away. Well, who is he? We don't know. Say, what is this? Mr. Braddock asked him, but he just looked kind of funny and said he didn't know, and then he fainted. Uh huh? Yeah, we put him on the bunk, got his clothes off him, and he's been sleeping like that ever since. Oh. Mr. Braddock thinks he's got whatever it is to call it, you know, when people forget who they are and what happened. And Joey, what are you doing? Looking for his clothes. Oh, they're hanging in the next room. What do you want with him? Look, you're taking care of the guy. You got to know who he is. Oh. Where are they? Hanging on the peg there. Pretty good set of threads. He could be a big shot or something. Wait. What have you got? His wallet. Maybe there's a card or something in here that'll tell... Hey, look at this hunk of lettuce. Well. Seventy-five hey. clams. Never mind about the 20, Mom. I'll take it from here. Joey, you should. You said yourself he don't remember nothing, so he won't miss it. Well, okay, but don't take any more than 20. Here's his identification card. Oh, what's it say? 
Uh, J.B. Medford, Chicago salesman. Hey. What's the matter? Salesman for a wholesale jewelry company. Well. Maybe that's what happened to him. These guys always carry stuff around with them. Maybe, maybe somebody clunked him over the head and took his load of ice. Yeah. Wait a minute. Now what did you find? His keys. Here, hold on to them, Mom. Oh, and, and what's that? Baggage check. He checked something at Grand Central. See you later, Mom. Where are you going? What do you think? I'm going to find out what he checked. Rutland speaking. Well, good morning, Mr. Rutland. This is Alan. Oh, hello, Alan. What have you got? Well, I finally located the porter who handled Medford's car on the train. Did he know anything? Medford arrived in New York yesterday morning, all right. But he had a little accident before the train got in. What do you mean? Well, they stopped at Harmon to switch over to electric, and mm -hmm. the porter saw Medford start out of his drawing room. Yeah. Just then, the train gave a sudden start, and Medford fell back, striking his head pretty hard against the metal door. Yes. Well, the porter helped him up and asked him all right. Mm -hmm. Medford assured him that he was. But when the porter saw him get off the train at Grand Central, Medford seemed to be in a sort of a fog. I see. You know, if the blow on the head was hard enough, it might have induced temporary amnesia. What do you think? It's highly possible. In which case, most anything could have happened to both Medford and the jewelry. Yes. Well, then what's the next move? We'll start checking hospitals first to see if anybody's been picked up. And if not, then we'll have to try... Mary, you, you mean to tell me you stood right here and let that boy of yours go through that stranger's clothes? Joey said if we was taking care of him, we had a right to know who he was. Well, all I'm saying is if he picks up what's checked at the depot, he better bring it right here to the proper owner or so help me, I'll put the police on him. Why don't you pipe down, Braddock? Huh? We can hear you bellowing all over the waterfront. All right, now you brought his bag, now drop it and go. What's in it, Joey? I haven't opened it yet. You got no right to either. Mom, give me the guy's keys, will you? Oh, sure. I said you got no right to open that yeah. bag. Maybe this is the right one. Now, look here. You leave it alone. That, that did it. Holy jump. Mom, Mom, look. What? Diamond. Yeah, there's enough ice there to make us all... Close up that bag. What? I said, close up that bag. I'm taking charge of it, and you're leaving this barge. Oh, wait a minute. I'm turning it over to the police. Look, are you crazy? There's a guy in there don't know nothing about nothing. We got a sack full of stuff we can fence off for a great big bundle. And yours and Mom's got to be enough to take you out of the barge business and set you up for good. He's right, John. Mary, you know what you're saying. Sure she does. She makes sense. You give that to me. Take your I hands you off. You... <coughs> oh. Joey, you hadn't ought to have done that. He cracked his head against the stove. He'll come out of it okay. I don't think so. Why? Because he's not breathing, son, that's why. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, three questions and answers on education. First question, what is the safest investment you can make for your children? An investment they can never lose regardless of inflation or deflation. One that will pay them daily dividends as long as they live. Well, in all the world, there's only one investment like that. It's education. Exceptional individuals do rise to the top without higher education. But the proportion of college families earning over $5,000 a year is eight times as great as the national average. Think it over, fathers and mothers. Doesn't it make you resolve that your children are going to get a college education no matter what happens? While your children are still young, start an equitable educational fund for them. Second question. 
What is an equitable educational fund? It is a plan that includes these important features. The equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education is ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payments. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. In addition, it summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative has a copy and will be glad to show it to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The diamond-studded double cross. The parent who always gives in to the will of his or her boy or girl, who makes too many allowances for and thereby condones their wrongdoings, that parent not only destroys the distinction between right and wrong in the mind of the child, but all too often seals off his or her own conscience from a sense of wrong. Little wonder then that the mother of young Joe Bristol, after long years of hardening herself to his wrongdoing, little wonder then that she was to be found automatically approving his deeds. Joe and his mother stood looking at the lifeless form of John Braddock lying on the floor of the barge galley. Then slowly the woman turns toward her son. I tell you, Joey, he's dead. Look, all I did was hit him. Could I help it if he fell back and cracked his head against the stove? Well, the police will blame you for it just the same. There's not going to be any police. But, Joey, how are we going to keep it from We're them? We're not going to be here when they come. What are we going to do? Wait a minute. Huh? That guy in the other room. He might have come to and heard something. He's beginning to come out of it. We got to get out of here fast. You mean just go off? The cops won't know I was ever here. But they'll know I live on the bar. They won't know you was here when it happened. They might even think that... Yeah. That's it. What? Nobody knows that guy in Medford is here, do they? No. Then nobody's gonna know when he got here. What do you mean, son? With his wallet. Oh, I took it out of his coat pocket where you left it to show to Mr. Braddock. Here it is. Okay. Joey, why are you putting it in Mr. Braddock's pocket? I'm not putting it all the way in. I'm leaving a part of it sticking out. Oh. Now, with something heavy, something like, uh... Yeah. This'll do. Crowbar is just the thing. Huh? I gotta smear a little blood off his head on the crowbar to make it look real, don't I? I don't get it. Just keep your fingers crossed that Medford don't come to you. But, Joey... Shh. What did you do? The crowbar is lying on the floor by Medford, right where he dropped it after slugging Braddock with it for stealing his wallet and jewels. Get it, Mom? No. Medford passed out from the knot on the head Braddock gave him first. Now, all we got to do is scoop, scoop up the sack of jewels, leave the empty sample case here, and scram. But, Joey, I... Look, Mom, Medford's coming, too. We got to get out of here. <laughs> 
Mr. Medford, what time was it when you regained consciousness? I, I don't know exactly, Mr. Rutland. But as soon as I saw where I was and, and all this, I went to call the police. And I guess they called you at the FBI right away. Well, that couldn't have been more than an hour ago, then. I don't know the meaning of any of this, sir. I swear it. What's the last thing you remember happening? The train had stopped at Harmon. I started from my drawing room to the diner to get a cup of coffee. Yes. The train gave a sudden lurch. I fell backwards, striking my head against the metal door. You remember the blow? Yes. And I recall the porter helping me up. I told him I was all right, but I thought I'd better go back to my drawing room and sit down because I felt a bit dizzy. Then what? Believe me, sir, that's all I remember until I came to here a while ago. Then I... Yes. I found this crowbar with blood on it beside the bunk I was on. The rest you see for yourself. Oh. Find anything, Alan? His wife's things are still here. Wife? The dead man is John Braddock. The police said his wife lived on the barge with him. Mr. Rutland. Yes? Could I have... I mean, do you think it's possible that I did this? It is possible, yes, sir. Good Lord. It's possible, but too many things indicate, sir, that you didn't do it. This, for one. Huh? Braddock is lying here by the stove. Here's some blood on the stove door. Yes, but this crowbar. If Braddock had taken the jewelry, it would be somewhere here in the cabin. And it's not. He had a stepson, Joe Bristol, with a police record. Now, Joe could have done it and rigged up this clumsy piece of business with a wallet and a crowbar to throw suspicion your way. But how in the world did I get here in the first place? There's a lot we don't know yet, Mr. Medford. But we do know that the jewelry is gone, Braddock's wife is gone, and her son, that's Braddock's stepson, is a thief. That's enough for us to start on. Alan. Yes? Get back to the office and put out an alert on that list of jewelry. Right. I'll get the police to take over here, have a doctor look after Mr. Medford, and then I'll join you at the office. <laughs> Good morning, Alan. Good morning. Any line on young Bristol? Uh, I've combed the waterfront and every other known hangout of his for two days now. No lead. His mother seems to have vanished, too. If the job was Bristol's work, then he and his mother must be together. Well, the whole country is alerted on them. And the jewelry, too, so... Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Rutland speaking. Hello, Rutland. This is Durant, Pittsburgh office. Oh, hello, Durant. What's up? The police here have just turned up some of that Medford jewelry. Good. They found six pieces in a pawn shop here this morning. Well, fine. Alan and I will be in Pittsburgh on the next plane. Mom, haven't you got any brains at all? Well, what's the matter? What are you doing sitting here in the lobby? Well, I'm sorry, son. I told I... you to stay in the room. Well, I got nervous waiting for you. That's a big help. Half of Pittsburgh could spot you here. How'd you make out? Well, I got rid of another bunch of the stuff. That only leaves ten pieces I still got on me and four more you got. Yeah, they're up in the room. Swell. Now, here's what you do. Hmm? You go back to the room and stay there till you hear from me. Well, where are you going, Joey? I gotta make a phone call. Now, go on up to your room and stay there till you hear from me. You understand? Yes, Joe. What is it? How much money have we got so far? We're doing all right. Now, get up to the room quick. Okay. Police headquarters. Look, I'm only saying this once, pal, so listen. You want the dame that's got the rest of the hot Medford jewelry? She's in room 917. What did the room clerk say, Alan? He had the maid go up with some towels. Mrs. Braddock is still there, all right. Good. If that was her son who called the police here, it's about as dirty a double-cross as I've ever heard. Well, it couldn't have been anyone else. 
I think I know where he's headed for right now. Where? I checked with the hotel operator. The son called a Chicago number from his room this morning. Chicago? Yes, and I checked the Chicago number. It's a pawn shop. Uh, another fence. Mm-hmm. Which means he's got some more jewelry to get rid of. But he's on his way to Chicago. Here we are in Pittsburgh, and Mrs. Braddock is upstairs. You mean, how do we put them all together? Right. I've got an idea on that that may work. Wait here. I'm going upstairs to pay an unofficial call on Mrs. Braddock. Anybody here? Joey. Well, I'm a... Mom. Oh, Joey, I was so afraid something would go wrong and I'd miss you. How did you get here to Chicago? I flew here by plane last night, and I was at the pawn shop here first thing this morning. How did you know I'd be here? A friend of yours told me about it, Joey. He was the nicest man. He helped me with Wait a my... minute. A friend of mine? Yes. Not long after you left Pittsburgh, he came to the room where I was. Yeah. Yeah, and he told me where you were going and why and said the police were on your trail and I better get to you quick before they did. And he even helped me get on the plane. That's enough, Mom. I'm getting out of here. Now, Joey, wait. Shut the door and I'm getting out. Stay where you are, Bristol. Huh? Joey, this is the one. The I'm nice man. I'm a special man. agent of the FBI, Bristol. FBI? Don't bother to make a break for it out the door. My partner out there will be waiting for you. Okay, wise guy. Guess you think you're pretty smart putting one over on my dumb old you're lady, the but... dumb one, Bristol. Everything you did was dumb. The phony murder plant on Medford, your call to Chicago, and dumbest of all, the double crossing of your own mother. Tried for the theft of the jewelry and transporting it across a state line, Joe Bristol was sentenced to a term in a federal penitentiary. Execution of sentence was waived, however, in order that Bristol might be tried on the more serious charge of murder in connection with the death of his stepfather. For which crime he is now serving a long term in state prison. Bristol's mother received a lighter term for complicity in the jewel theft. Tonight's case was an extraordinary conclusion to a story of years of parental neglect the prime factor in the development of most of our criminals. In this case, a parent eventually became an actual accessory to her son's crime. But of practically every major crime, it may truthfully be said that the criminal's own mother or father was at least a silent accessory. For respect for law, for the rights and property and lives of others, the responsibility for teaching these things to the children of America belongs to the mothers and fathers of America. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children's future, an equitable educational fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. You'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Night of Terror. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Night of Terror, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.